can and do create money literally out of nothing simply by making loans. The money in your bank account doesn't really exist. If every single customer walked into their bank tomorrow to withdraw their cash, the system would collapse within hours because the money simply isn't there. Banks can only create money out of thin air by lending it to you or me or anyone else. Everything comes down to, can the government afford it? Where does the money come from? How do banks operate? All this stuff turns up in modern political discourse. And if you don't understand it, then you don't know what the hell's going on in the economy and the political system. About a month ago, I put out a video attacking how conventional economists explain money creation. It led to the exchange here with Bob Murphy, who's a good guy, I'm very happy to debate with Bob. But in that video, what I showed is that the conventional way economics textbooks teach that banks create money, which is called the fractional reserve banking model. That model is wrong for the simple reason that the only way it can work is if all loans are in cash. So that's what I explained in that video. Now, George Selgin intervened at this point in the discussion I was having with Bob Murphy, saying that it doesn't have to assume that loans are made in cash. When I lay it out using my double entry bookkeeping program, Ravel, it shows that you know, unless the loans are in cash, the model doesn't work. And you can see that George and I don't get particularly good on. He says I'm insufferable. I'm very pleased to be called insufferable by a conventional economist. I'm explaining that cash withdrawals are not necessary to it. I'm not endorsing the model. So he's not endorsing the model, but he's wrong, categorically wrong, say that the model doesn't need loans to be in cash. This does sound like an esoteric debate. It's how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. But this esoteric debate dominates economic discourse these days. Everything comes down to, can the government afford it? Where does the money come from? How do banks operate? All this stuff turns up in modern political discourse. And if you don't understand it, then you don't know what the hell's going on in the economy and the political system. And by the way, if you want to use my proprietary software Ravel for economic analysis too, you get it as a free bonus inside my seven week Rebel Economist Challenge, like over 600 people have already done. To learn more, apply at stevekeen.com. If you're at all interested in how the economic system functions and why we have the sorts of paralysis we're seeing today in political circles. Here I'm saying the model that is taught by the textbooks only works if all loans are in cash and George simply rejects my point. And he says here, it is demeaning to have to convince Steve Keen or anyone that I can handle basic bank T accounts. But to get him off my bank, I do so to illustrate that the naive textbook multiplier story doesn't depend on cash being lent. What I'm doing in this video is I'm taking all the points that George makes in this tweet stream here and putting it into the double entry bookkeeping format that my Ravel software enables you to lay out to see how financial transactions actually work. So if you're at all concerned about monetary dynamics, government spending, how the financial system works, you need Ravel to understand what the hell's going on. And the point is that even people who have dedicated their lives to economics are making mistakes because they don't have this double entry book keeping framework in their heads. The systems they use, the verbal logic like George lays out here, doesn't let you see the full dynamics of financial transactions. So here is George saying he's going to lay out the conventional way that the textbooks say that banks create money and show that I'm wrong, that loans don't have to be in cash for this model to work. So let's see what goes on here. On this side, I've got George's allegations about the nature of the system. And over here, I've got my Ravel software where I'm laying out the basic ideas that he has in his model. What he has to give an overall overview of his system, he has the central bank creates excess reserves for Bank A. Bank A then lends those reserves to a borrower called Joe. Joe then buys something off a person called Jim who banks at Bank B. And then this is how the process is supposed to work. Let's start with the first point that uh, George begins with here. It's, it's a starting situation. All banks are lent up holding only required reserves. What that means is that the ratio between the reserves that each bank has and the deposits that each bank bank has, has reached the maximum allowed by the legal system, which is a, a 10 to 1 ratio in America's case. That was abolished five years ago, by the way. Uh, but nonetheless, this is how conventional textbooks still think, as if that rule still applies. I'm setting it up in, in Ravel, as uh, George argues here. So for Bank A, for example, I've got Bank A having total deposits of 550 and reserves of 55. So that's a 10 to 1 ratio for Bank A. And Bank B has total reserves of 990. Bank B has total deposits of 990 and reserves of 99. So they're also fully lent up. Now, what George argues happens, first of all, is that the central bank adds X dollars in reserves to the system, all of which go to Bank A. Well, how does it do that? The way that would happen is that the central bank would buy bonds from A. Notice here that as well as having reserves and loans, 
Bank A also has bonds. I, I won't put the numbers here. I'll just type a word. CB buy from A. So that's bonds have risen up that way. And if the central bank buys those bonds, then it does it by crediting the bank account that Bank A has at the central bank with the reserves of A. So I've got to type exactly the same thing here in this uh, window here. So CB buy from A, and now that account is balanced. So that particular part of George's example works fine. Now, what that means is from Bank A's point of view, it's now got these extra reserves. How did they turn up? Well, that was by selling bonds that Bank A currently owns. So we're going to have a minus CB buy from A here, and that line's correct. So I've now got the accounting correct for the actual central bank creation of excess reserves for Bank A. Now the next line, Bank A lends its excess reserves to a borrower, Joe. All right, so lending excess reserves is just going to have got a minus in the reserve accounts. So let's create an extra row for uh, Bank A here, and I'll just type this in here, and this is A lends to Joe. So lending from reserves is going to be minus lend to Joe. Now let's look and see what George argues over here. Money coming out of uh, the reserves minus. That means that if there's reserves have gone down for the bank, it's lending to Joe. Let's put that into Joe's deposit account. So that's now typing the term here, lend to Joe. Notice what Ravel is doing, and it's the only program that does this. It's applying the rules of double entry bookkeeping to let you assess whether somebody's model of how the financial system works is actually correct. George has written here, Bank A lends its extra reserves to a borrower, Joe. So he simply thinks that's quite straightforward. And notice he's saying up the top here, it doesn't depend on cash being lent. I'm sorry, but it does. Because to imagine you can have reserves go down and deposits go up, violates the rule of accounting. Assets minus liability minus equity equals zero. That's the law of accounting that has to be applied to every transaction to be correct in accounting terms. But that means this one simply isn't correct. I cannot show the reserves going down and Joe's deposit account going up. It violates the rules of accounting. So what else can I do? Well, one other possibility is to say that the reserves go down and the loans go up. So that we can type that in. And that now but passes the rules of accounting. So reserves have gone down, loans have gone up, assets minus liabilities, Michael and minus equity equals zero on this row. So how can we actually give Joe the money that's equivalent to the loan he's just taken out? From the borrower's point of view, poor Joe here at the moment has got an extra liability, but no extra asset. And I know I can't put the extra asset inside deposits. That gives me the error that comes up with the program immediately. What about if I put it in cash? Now it works. So step two in George's uh, layout of reasons why I'm wrong, that cash is not necessary for the money multiplier model to work, falls over because to actually achieve step two, there has to be a loan in cash. Now this is the sort of error that permeates through conventional economists. And there's no, no point in me trying to do the remainder here. I've already had to do what George says is not necessary, and that's to bring cash into the lending process. But this shows the extent to which economists are unaware of the accounting behind the banking system. Now that might sound ridiculous to you if you're not an economist, and frankly, it is ridiculous. How come a profession that is supposed to be the font of wisdom on the economy doesn't understand the banking system? And this comes back to the origins of conventional economics, which goes right back to Adam Smith and Ricardo and Jean-Baptiste Say and a whole range of thinkers back in the beginning of the 19th century. They ended up ha having a model of the economy, which is fundamentally one in which the banking system doesn't matter. Their logic tells them that money is just what they call a veil over barter. So if you ignore the money system, you see the economy better than if you take a serious look at it. And therefore, they build models of the macroeconomy which do not include banks or debt or money. Now, therefore, they think they've got the accounting right, but they haven't done it in the first place to find out. So here is George very confidently making the statements you can see in this tweet. And so the first one, step one, yes, that works uh, by Bank A selling bonds to the central bank. But this step simply does not work. Okay? You can't get that to function unless the loan's in cash. Now, George is laying out this whole thing to say that I'm wrong, to say that cash is necessary. Unfortunately, George, 
it is necessary for the money multiplier model to work. I might try modeling the rest of your system, but your argument to reject my proposition falls over at your second step. And this is typical of economists. So this would not matter if this is just like a, a religious dispute between two bunches of monks in the medieval period that is fundamentally characterizes a lot of economic debates. But this comes down to affecting our attitudes about government spending, our attitudes about the private banking system, whether banks should create money in the first place. They do, not this way, but they do create money. Is society better off for that or worse off for that? All these issues come down to what's the structure of the financial system. And economists have been having these arguments and making claims like Selgin is making here for over a century without ever developing any way to say structurally, do these arguments we're making accord to the rules of accounting, which has to be the case if you're talking about monetary transactions. Now, they don't do it. They make mistakes like this, and they continue being incredibly verbose about their point of view and how right they are, when in fact they don't understand the very basics because they don't understand the accounting. That's a huge problem for humanity that we're in this situation. So. I probably will at some point finish up this model. But George, you can't even get past point two without making a mistake. So it's about time you bought a copy of Ravel and try to lay this stuff out for yourself and then see whether your arguments work or not. Because this particular slam dunk that you thought you did against me, you fall over even before you get anywhere near the hoop. You can't even get your second step right. Many other truth seekers and want to learn 50 years of real economics from me in only seven weeks. You'll love my new seven week Rebel Economist Challenge as well. To apply, go to stevecane.com. If you qualify, you can attend my lectures, ask me questions personally every week, and make friends with a great group of like minded people. So, again, like many others, go to stevecane.com to apply as well for the seven week Rebel Economist Challenge. Good luck.